Good morning. This morning, for part two of God at the Movies series, I'll be referencing the movie Waterworld. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, I won't really uh, be talking too much about the actual content of this movie, uh, but instead we'll be referencing some circumstances of its release, its production costs, and its notoriety. So when asked to think about a major box office movie flops, the movie Waterworld also often comes to people's minds. It was a futuristic movie that uh, after ice caps have melted, the earth was completely covered in water. And people had to survive on boats and these floating atolls. It's kind of an action, uh, exciting, thriller kind of movie. Uh, but the major reason that this, this movie uh, gained fame as a flop is because at the time, the production costs continued to balloon greater and greater and greater, making it the most expensive movie ever made in 1995. It cost over seven, $175 million uh, because of the expensive floating sets like you see here, uh, uncooperative weather, and extended weeks of filming. Now, even today, $175 million for a movie is pretty expensive, but in 1995, it was astronomical. So in many ways, Waterworld was already fighting an uphill battle when it was released into theaters. Despite debuting as the number one movie, the initial box office sales were not strong enough to recoup the original amounts that were spent to make the film. And combined with lackluster reviews, Waterworld may have lodged itself firmly into our minds as a flop. But interestingly, that is not where the story ends. You see, Waterworld, despite its inflated costs to produce, did actually end up turning quite a profit over time. After tallying up all the domestic release money and international box office revenue, the movie grossed more than $260 million in theaters. And that does not even include all the money that was made from DVDs and TV rights to the film. So according to Pastor Greg's definitions from last week, I believe this movie would technically fall into the subcategory of flip-flop or flop-flip, if I remember correctly. Now, I'm not going to stand here and actually say that Waterworld is a good or uh, great or even good movie, uh, but numerically speaking, it does not show up on lists of movies that lost money. And so it is difficult to consider it a flop, even though many often do. While this unearned distinction is unfortunate for Waterworld, it is all too common for the world that we live in. Quite often the world remembers our gaffes and our first impressions, making it difficult to pivot and to start fresh, to begin again and reinvent ourselves. We too do this to one another, filing away grievances, remembering the slights and disappointments of others. Living out a new identity or turning over a new leaf can be difficult. Change is hard, and there is often people in our lives that will insist on reminding us about our own histories. And while there is value in learning from the past, it is also important that we drop baggage that we carry if it prevents us from moving forward. Fortunately, we serve a God who holds a deep love for us regardless of how we may feel or view our own past. God has a profound desire for our best selves and calls us forward into that reality. Nothing is irredeemable or beyond reconciliation for the endless, unconditional, unfathomable love of God. And so this brings us to today's scripture about the dramatic transformation of Saul, a persecutor of Christians, to Paul, one of Christianity's greatest apostles. And I'll just be reading uh, from verses 1 to 9 and then 17 to 19. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. 
They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strengths. This is a powerful story, and probably one of the most popular conversion stories found in Scripture. It is worth noting that this is not just your average story of redemption, of someone seeking to simply just live a better life. Saul was quite a threat to the early Christians. He literally approved of the execution of Christians like the stoning of Stephen, which is just a few chapters earlier. And yet ultimately he becomes one of the most important ambassadors for Christ the world has ever known. This is an example of a real turnaround. So what does this mean for us today? I can admit that I have never had a road to Damascus experience where Jesus appeared and spoke to me directly with instructions. And I hardly know very many people who have. However, I have seen Jesus. I've seen Jesus in the countless mentors and adults in my life who have taken the time to redirect me, to guide me, to teach me, to show me compassion of Christ. I have heard Jesus in the singing of children around campfires and in the stillness of the forest. I have felt Jesus when I have feared that I was alone and surrounded only by darkness. I have recognized Jesus in the outpouring of special ministries supported by this congregation, and most recently, I have known Jesus within the powerful, life-giving miracle of the recent birth of a son. There are few things in my short time on this planet that have so dramatically shown me the life-giving, ever-changing, renewing nature of God like the recent birth of my son Oliver. This miraculous event has only reaffirmed that God is ever-present and ever-moving in our midst. God is not static. God is active, changing, growing within and through each and every one of us. And sure, this existence and the love of God may never change throughout time, but the way that we encounter God, the way that God encounters us, the divine dance that takes place each and every day is an evolving miracle. It is all too easy for us to forget that this is a dynamic, living and changing world. We get sucked into our daily routines, the normalcy, accepting the labels that we are given by others and forgetting that we are truly alive and capable of participation in that divine dance happening all around us. On this day of receiving new members, it is easy for us to see a clear example of what change and transformation can look like within the body of Christ. But transformation is not only reserved for new members. Any day, every day, we are invited to be transformed by Christ. We can read in the book of Romans, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Following Jesus is not a one-time act, but a lifelong commitment. Have we forgotten that this is a gift and not a burden? We can embrace the challenge and celebrate the newness of every single day, even the days that do not go well, that are filled with pain and suffering in this life that we endure. These are experiences of existence. They are difficult, but they are still reminders that we are alive and living. The creation of this world was never a guarantee. Existence was never a given. The fact that we are here, aware, breathing, alive, this is a gift from God. Obviously, many things disappoint us in this world. There are great troubles and systemic failures, powers and principalities, evils that threaten and challenge us every day. And while the world will continue to find ways to remind us of our past failures and current shortcomings, we can celebrate that we are loved by a God that does not measure us by our beginnings and does not remember us 
by our greatest failures. We are called towards greatness. We are called into love. We are called to be the hands and the feet of Christ. And we are called into that existence each day, every day. You have not missed your chance. You are never too late or too old to follow your heart and to answer the call from the creator of this universe. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad. Change comes to those who seek it, and while there is uncertainty and coincidence, it is through our efforts in working together with God in the example of Christ that we can create a more positive future for ourselves and for all those that come after us. Our lives are meant to be lived fully. We must open our eyes to the beauty and creativity of the world, step forward in confidence in our faith in Christ. We are not to be defined by our past mistakes or immobilized by our failures. We are to walk forward with them and seek simply to be better. Perhaps you think the world has labeled you a flop. Perhaps you have even started to believe it. But it is never, never too late to reclaim tomorrow, for tomorrow has not yet come. We serve an incredible God, the creator of the universe who does not count our sins against us, but is always, always rooting for us, cheering us on every single step of the way. And I think many of us already know this. We feel it deep in our bones. We just have trouble remembering it all the time. And it's one of the reasons that we come here each Sunday, to feel that love and to worship God. Oh, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The movie Waterworld, by definition, is not a flop. Maybe at the start, after the first few weeks it was, but in time it gradually made its profits and has since been enjoyed and loved by millions. Likewise, we do not need to limit or confine ourselves to who we were yesterday or remain stuck as who we are today. I was just reminded a few days ago in one of the most profoundly earth-shattering ways that God remains active and moving in this world. Every time that I look at our son Oliver, I am reminded that the world moves forward. It creates, it grows. God is doing a new thing, and God has always been doing new things. It is our calling as followers of Jesus to get on board with it. We are loved by the creator of the universe. We can seize the day. We can start today, and we can do it again and again and again. No matter our past failures, our current inadequacies, or the insults from others, it will never, ever be too late to commit or recommit ourselves to following in the way of Jesus. And in doing so, no matter how the world labels us, we will never be a flop in the eyes of God.